Hi, I'm Mark Kramer. I'm a senior lecturer at Harvard <laughs> Business School, a founder of FSG, and a senior advisor to the Shared Value Initiative. And it is my great pleasure uh, to be in conversation today with Francesco Storaci, who is the CEO of the NL Group. Uh, he's been the CEO since 2014 and has really led a remarkable transformation at this company that began 60 years ago as a state-owned utility providing electricity for Italy and has now become the largest provider of renewable energy in the world, operating in more than 30 countries. The company has a long list of innovations from being the first to create a sustainability bond that it, it rewards the company's performance in helping to reach the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It has been the largest issuer of green bonds. It has committed to close all coal-fired power plants within the next five years. And it has launched what it calls open power, which is a strategy to help lead an energy transition that will be just, affordable, and inclusive for all. So a remarkable company and a remarkable leader. And I will also say that Enel has been a terrific champion of the concept of creating shared value and a longtime supporter of the Shared Value Initiative, for which I'm very grateful. So Francesco, good morning, good afternoon. So nice to be with you. It's a pleasure, Mark. To be with you and thanks for your kind words. Uh, I really look forward to to this exchange. I, I you know, I find uh, I just have a small comment. It, it didn't happen in sixty years. Uh, it happened in less than that. You know, we changed uh, in the last say nine years, more or less, in the direction you you indicated, which means that basically anyone else can do that. So it's possible. It doesn't take magics. <laughs> Well, that, that's exactly what I want to talk about, Francesca, yeah. because I have, at, at Harvard, I've been doing a lot of research on ESG performance of companies. And I'm sad to say that what I've seen is a great deal of posturing. A lot of companies that are making very marginal or peripheral changes to their operations to reduce emissions 10%, 20%, whatever it might be. And yet what we see is that companies really need to go through a fundamental change in how they operate their business if they're gonna create a business that works in a decarbonized uh, economy. So let's talk a little bit more, Francesco, about how Enel has managed to make this shift, which is really fundamental to go from coal-fired power plants to renewable energy. Well, I think, uh, you know, it, everything starts with the, an observation that I think most companies need sooner or later to, to do, which is a reflection on how long is it that they intend to be in business, which is, well, you know, I, I totally respect the any time frame, provided one is honest about it. So you can say, I want, I think the company should be around for the next 50 years. It's a long time, it's a long enough time. I want the company to be around the next five years. And then that gives you a little bit of a different choices and a different set of tools that you want to have to, to do well in that time span. So I guess for us, it was obvious that we wanted to be around longer. So 50 years is, is a long enough time for any decision to really have an impact. And in that sense, we understood we had to change uh, the business practice and the say sustainability profile of how we did our business. Um, everything started with this reflection on time, I would say. And, and if you want sustainability is directly linked to a time frame. So you want to do something that in a certain time frame results in a neutral or beneficial impact on, on the system around you. But if you just don't put the time in the time dimension in this uh, equation, it's meaningless. Anything can be sustainable and unsustainable without a time reference. So if you want, that was the first thing. And then the second step 
was started with CSV. I mean, started with shared value. Okay, it's the, the word sustainability was not that clear uh, in its for subsequent uh, evolution. So it all started with saying, can we remain long enough in a society without sharing some of the value we create with the society itself? So the shared value concept was the embryo out of which everything else uh, then came up. If you want, you can make a case that the ESG theory is an evolution of the shared value thinking with some more structured and, and multidimensional approach, but it, everything starts on that side, okay? So in a way, the shared value initiative was part of the early stages of our, of our change. Um, and the decarbonization pattern was clearly, in our case, the most obvious, uh, the most obvious solution to, to this, if you want, existential uh, reflection, how we want to survive over the years. So this was the very beginning uh, of our thinking. And then, of course, it took a while to, to, in, to develop everything. But if you want, from, from a conceptual standpoint, it, it evolved in the first two, three years of our adventure um, with some ma major decisions that we, we took at that time. One of them, again, on time based on the fact that we did not want to have investments that took more than three years to be materialized and completed and start to create value, which for this industry was a major revolution. This is an industry that has a 10 year internal clock. So, so, so this three years thing was, if you want a, a forced, constraint that we injected into the system. But out of that, we ruled out an investment in nuclear energy because it takes clearly much more than 10 years on large, very large uh, hydroelectric schemes that typically take 10 plus years. Coal is more than three years. It also ruled out, uh, for example, uh, offshore wind for the same reason. Okay, so, and, and why we wanted to shrink this is that we wanted this to really be a measurable evolution so that people get motivated by seeing the progress in their average professional life in a single position. You know, typically a manager stays two, three, four years in a position and moves else, but, but it, it's good to see something happening during that stage of your professional life. And that was a huge, uh, and you change, it changed everything in the company in, in, a, in a, if you want in a deep way, and maybe we don't have the time to go through this, but it started like that. It, it was coupled with uh, this, the discovery that the company had deep rooted uh, genes in, in a spirit of service to, to communities and to society, which I think most utilities have in, in their own chromosomes, maybe not all are conscious about it, but we made it, we made a conscious discovery about this. And so the purpose of our work became very strong because we coupled that, you know, they want to serve and we want to give value. So for people, this was a huge motivational uh, uh, theme, you know, it, it helped a lot. That's Definitely. terrific. And, and, and I loved actually the sort of paradox between thinking about the long term of decades as you must as the leader of a major company a major energy but company. then short then yeah. but then yes but then yeah. saying okay so as a result things are changing so quickly that we can't do any project that doesn't reach fruition and begin to produce positive returns in three years and that therefore pushed you into renewable energy not just because you were trying to look good for your you know no. sustainability report but as really a core business strategy to become more successful in a changing world and, you know, yeah. one of the reasons why it was powerful, it's also because at the very beginning of this transition, the financial community was not fully on board on that. Now everybody's super ESG, now, but at the beginning, there was a bit of a cold um, climate <laughs> around this whole thing. So this three-year cycle 
they loved they loved it they, they said okay fine i mean you might be a little visionary or maybe just a little bit off the vision track but if you really shorten the investment cycle we love that so that kept them engaged that's very important yeah. because again as you say as a leader of a global enterprise you have to think about the long-term future but the investors but survive often are more, much more <laughs> focused on the short term so again you yeah. you found a way to, to manage that beautifully and i know as you've thought about um the environmental impact and how to really change that of a now you've begun to think about promoting the idea of a circular economy. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say a little bit about, first of all, what that means? And second of all, why you see that as important to announce transition? This came a little later, okay? And it came when we started looking past the decarbonization early stage. We said, okay, decarbonizing, I think, you know, we, build the renewable plants, we shut down thermogenerating plants, we do this progressively faster, but we got pretty good at it. And then and then so we were pretty strong saying, okay, that's not finished, but it's well uh, addressed and it, and the trajectory is clear and we can project by the, the you know more or less the, the the phasing out of coal generating plants. But we started midway through this process, it was 2018, 2019, to see that there was a moment where we discovered uh, that our scope one emissions were, which, which were large. I mean, every utility has huge scope sure. one emissions. I mean, they started to become at par or lower than the scope three emissions. Hmm. Okay, so the first time I remember, I said, no, there's something wrong, do it again, do the calculation again, it cannot be. But then we saw this coming. I mean, we saw that the scope three emissions were by far going to outnumber the scope one emission. And why scope one was addressed and, and, and going down, with scope three required a lot more attention and a lot more effort. And if you look at scope three, you have a lot of things. You have two universes, your customers, what they do with the energy you sell them. And then you have your supply chain. So the, all the, the vendors, the suppliers, the contractors, the whole thing that works with you, for you to do that stuff. You know, not the customers because the customers is, is a self uh, uh, solved problem. Once you close this, when you get there with scope one, also customers immediately become decarbonized. So that's easy, but your suppliers, they need to do it on their own. So they need to really get into the same share value concept, the same, you know, they, they have to do the, the, the journey that, and there are some of them that are easy, easily fixed, you know, a little bit more renewable energy and a little bit, dumb, but many others really cannot get to a decarbonization potential without recycling without reusing without using more so their circular concept came us came to us through scope three through the scope three effort um, and 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 that is now the major effort we have i mean today the the nut we still need to crack fully is that one you know the scope three of our supply chain which is very long. You can imagine it's a lot of people in many different countries, not all at the same level of say understanding of the importance of this. So the, the, the circular economy for us means reduce your footprint, not just on carbon, but on raw materials. You reduce your foot, foot, footprint on physically also, you know, how much of a space you occupy after you dismantle stuff what you do with the blades of turbines, you know, they're huge things. All this stuff needs to be really rethought from scratch. So it's a huge playground for innovation. It's a huge playground for value creation. And also I think for innovation in the production processes of several industries that start finally to pay attention. That's fantastic. And again, so many companies are still focused just on their own internal uh, carbon emissions, other impacts at scope one, uh, to really think seriously about how to address scope three, uh, tremendously important. And I love that you saw this as an opportunity for real innovation uh, that can- There's no other way. Yeah. 
a better business model as well as a, a better environmental footprint. You know, you're, there are many companies thinking about decarbonization. One of the things that really distinguishes Enel is the fact that you talk about this idea of a just, affordable, and inclusive energy transition. Mm -hmm. And that seems to get not just to the E, but to the S in ESG. Yeah and is something not a lot of other companies are thinking about. So tell me, how do you think about this idea of a just and equitable transition for energy? You know, we were forced uh, to think about it, to think about it a lot and, and, and very, very much in detail and in a very concrete way, because imagine that we had this transition on, a, on ourselves. So we had to shut down many, many thermal generating plants. And we had to find what to do with the people that was working, that were working in, in these facilities. And what about them? And what about their future? What about their questions? What about their concerns? And, and on one side. On the other side, we needed to grow fast on renewables. And we didn't have enough people to do that. So we needed to add talent, add capacity, add manpower. So. First of all, we said to we said this transition happens everywhere, but it, it has had to happen on us first. So how do we manage this transition? Shall we fire three thousand people and hire three thousand people from scratch to two different sets of people, or should we take these three thousand people and say, guys, you know, let's sit down and and recognize what's going on? The facts are the following: these plants are going to be shut down. This is the hard truth. No, I mean, this is not our fault. It's the world is going there. So just live in peace, but this is going to happen. So what about you in this context? There is another way. There is, you have to go retrain. You have to go maybe live a little bit farther or in a different place. You have to learn at, at a completely different job if you want, of course. Uh, but there is a, yacht, a lot of opportunities for you guys, and please understand that. And, and, and then we had to provide the tools, the, 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 you know, the, the training, and also the opportunities for them that, that made sense to them. Made it. I would say the, um, there was a surprising uh, reaction that was quite mind Bagling at the beginning, because the the blue colors, the people in the plants, they said, "Look, it took you a while, but it was obvious to us since several years already." So great that you talk to us openly. Great that you don't try to hide the truth. So let's do this. Let's let's sit down and see how we can do this. So there was not a. a like a surprise or a negative reaction. It was, on the contrary, uh, almost a, an ironical criticism saying, you know, okay, finally you got it. So how do we do this? They wanted to do this. That's so there was not a problem. And, some and, middle management, if you want, some middle management didn't like it. So, but it was like less than 3% of the overall workforce. So that's totally marginal. So we yeah. have to just do this. And, and we're sort of talking about scope one, in a sense, uh, around the social. One. But I know that you also are thinking about the large proportion of people in the world who don't have access to electricity. Yeah. And what that can mean as a growth opportunity for now. And of course, this opens. Uh, there are two incredible uh, points of view here. One is that you still have around 800, 900 million people, depending who, how you count having or not having enough uh, access to electricity, which is a huge potential customer base and, and a huge potential investment uh, opportunity. On top of that, let's not forget, you have the progressive electrification of the world as we know. So imagine what happens with, with cars. You know, The whole automotive industry shifting to electricity means that another industry is going through the transition we had 10 years ago. So you can imagine the same discussion on the shop floors of, of automotive factories, not on the shop floor of power plants with people saying, okay, it took you a while, but finally, what do you do? And then you can imagine the increasing in consumption of electricity that this brings about. So it's not just that you have 
more customers, but also that the same customers consume more electricity and less gasoline, less diesel oil, less gas. So electricity really is booming as far as the business volume is concerned. In that sense, if you want, we sit in a great place in the transition. That is, we need more people than the one we have today. But we need to retrain the people we have if we want to have this in a just transition manner. So that's a cost if you want, but I see this more an investment than a cost. That's terrific. Thank you. Well, I know we are running short on time, but again, I'm, I'm so struck by the difference between what I've seen happen in the last few years at Enel and the many, many companies out there whose ESG performance I study and seem to be doing so little relative to the urgency of the challenge that the world faces. What advice do you have for other companies, for other corporate leaders, and for people who may not yet be the CEO, but are at a senior level within their yeah. company and care about this kind of transition? I think the, the, the reflection on how long you wanna be around, this is fundamental because this must be done without self delusions. I mean, it must be clear to, to the CEO or the, or the executive team leading the company that time is running short. And by the way, the acceleration is ongoing. I mean, what was X long in time frame 10 years ago is now X minus 30%. So the, the compression of time is an experience of our private life also. So this is going on. And please consider that this is a super important reflection. How long do we want the company to be around? Because you cannot think that you can be around being carbon intensive or not really engaging in this and prosper. You can be around and agonize, but that's different. I don't think anyone wants that. So I think that's number one. And the number two thing is innovate a lot because there, any existing um, business practice can be improved or changed in the light of the acronyms of ES and G, provided that innovation is put at work. Without innovation, I think it is really difficult. I mean, trying harder with the same stuff doesn't really work. I, I think that's a fantastic <laughs> Point. And, and of course, one of the striking things also at Enel is this idea of uh, innovability, that you've actually taken the innovation research and development department and combined it with the sustainability group uh, to really yes. focus innovation on solving the problems of sustainability. And that has led you to some really remarkable and powerful and profitable innovations. I think you have uh, a lot of innovation around. I mean, there's there's a lot of bright people. Okay, what they what they really need is what kind of problems they want to apply their intelligence to. So, so the real point of innovation is finding the problems to be solved rather than solving them. Because I think there's a lot of people out there. So, the structuring of the problem is important. What do you really want from innovation? Because you know you can have an answer which is, I want to beat my competition. So I want a product that beats my competition. That's great, a fantastic motivated, motive for, 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 for innovation. And that I think is completely, I think at this point is still by and large, the largest driver of innovation on the market today. Beat competition, no matter how, what better, better, better innovate. Then you have another is, which is, can I add another innovation motivation or another innovation trend, which is change the business practices so that they become more sustainable. Is this a competitive advantage? It is maybe not, or maybe yes. Most of the time it leads to be a competitive advantage, but in itself is a risk mitigation factor. So you innovate to reduce your risk profile, which is also a big, a big um, important thing for companies because you can beat competition, but remain a risky bet. 
So if you combine these two things, then you're better off and you balance out. That's terrific. Well, Francesco, I would love nothing better than to continue the conversation all day, but you have a very large company to run. So I'm really grateful for the time you could spend with us. And I think Anel, again, is such a remarkable example of a company that has gone through a fundamental transition of its business model in ways that have made it more successful, more profitable, more competitive, and aligned with a just and inclusive energy transition to decarbonization. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Mark. It's been really a pleasure. See you around next time. Absolutely.